We have here the um, the legend in the flesh, uh, the one and only Mark yeah. DeClive Lowe, uh, all the way from Los Angeles. Uh, he's been a uh, big mentor to me. In fact, I think pretty much every single album I've been a part of, um, you can see behind me here, I've got one, uh, that's 1.1, that's the um, sound signature seven inch, which I did with the Theo Parrish cover on it. Um, got a love requited over there. So um, Mark Clavelo has been a part nice. of all of them. And um, it's awesome to have him be a part of Crisis and Opportunity Volume 1 London. And um, it's good to have you. So... Yeah, bro. Um, my first question to you, uh, it's a bit of a generic one, but how did you get your start as a musician? Man, my my dad made me. He... he he decided I was going to learn piano and I was way too young to make that decision myself mm -hmm. and I was scared and I was scared of him so I did what I was told um, and that was pretty much that like I you know high school I started dabbling with drum machines and, and synths mm -hmm. um, and then did a real deep jazz dive and so there were lots of things that happened along the way but at the root of it yeah my dad mm -hmm. he was he decided that all his kids would learn music and for me it stuck. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And um, how old were you when you moved to London? I was 23, 24 when I went there. Okay. Um, and I guess that, yeah. that being, being in London for you, because this was not not to give away your age, but you know, you're, you're a well seasoned veteran of the scene now. And um, when, when you were in London, it was sort of the cusp of um, broken beat music, which for me, I guess looking at the outside, was like this really interesting intersection of um, electronic music production, dance music, and jazz, I guess, elements of jazz harmony and uh, to, to an extent um, elements of jazz improvisation all kind of like merging into this crazy melting pot. and. What was that like for you, um, being a part of that scene and the sort of that cusp of this new world of music that's coming up? No, one hundred percent, man. I mean, when I when I got to London, and it was nineteen ninety eight, and I remember you know, I met Phil Asher first, um, and Phil, rest in peace. Mm. Phil introduced me to you know all that all that community, Bug from the Attic. Bigo, IG Culture, Atias, all those guys. I remember going to to Bug Studio for the first time in early 1998, and there were albums which were already finished on the hard drive. You know, the the Afrinal album, the Neon Fusion album, something else, Osagian G Force. You know, albums that wouldn't come out for still a couple of years, but they're already finished. So the it's like the music was very fully formed at that point already, and for me, like I've, I've, I've said a few times that it was kind of like, it was like coming across this music that had, it was inspired by everything I've ever been inspired by and it was put together in a way that I could never have imagined possible. Right. And that's pretty much it. I mean, you know, like you just said, it was this amalgamation of, of genres and perspectives and concepts and approaches, but put together in a really fresh way and and I wasn't scared of being challenging. You know, I feel mm. like I feel like acid jazz for all the all the good it brought in its own way. It wasn't it wasn't trying to challenge. You know, it was trying to kind of just sneak in. Right, and it was <laughs> sort of uh, like without without being dismissive. It was sort of it was quite functional music. Like yeah, it, it's a to totally. You know, if you had a soloist, it's like they're basically just you know someone just soloing over a loop of right. a groove. Mm. Um, Whereas Broken was much more, I felt it was much, the, the assimilation was much deeper. Mm. You know, it wasn't just about treating the track like a metronome and blowing over it. Mm. Um, it was more about how do we, you know, there's a lot of subversity in it. Like how do you, how do you, how do you give the audience some really experimental shit but keep them grooving, you know? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, I mean, this is, I mean, it might be a bit of a ethereal thing to try put your finger on, but what is it about 
London in particular that was able to breed that kind of music and have that kind of because because I guess when I think about it like that sort of like there's been lots of cross pollination of different kinds of music that's happened in lots of different places around the world but to me like what was happening in London and that sort of broken beat scene and I guess you would what you call it like sort of early mid 2000s through to the mid 2010s ish give or take was mm. like really like intriguingly unique and I guess probably underappreciated but the way that it took like so for, so firstly with like the drum rhythms not nothing in electronic music was really coming at these kinds of rhythms in that way where there's this obvious sort of like Nigerian Afrobeat sort of Tony Allen kind of influence and mm -hmm. in how producers were putting the drums together as well as like a lot of sort of Latin kind of rhythms and how that intersected, but it was like so well produced from an electronic perspective that it made it hold mm. up against so much of this, like, I guess club music and that was maybe had a bit more of a static kind of rhythm behind it. And um, it, to me, it's kind of interesting how, with, with all due respect to our homeland, New Zealand, um, it, that kind of music could never have come out of a place <laughs> like New Zealand. And and I, don't, course, I, I mean, you know, and not. that's <laughs> and that, that like no disrespect to New Zealand on that at all, but it's like there's something to me about London itself as like a a place where where that kind of yeah. music could have only come out of a city like London. And I mean, London London's a melting pot. You know, mm. it's like the that blend of, of like the, the, the socio cultural blend of of the Car of the West Indies Caribbean. All, all the Caribbean islands and the African influence and then the European influence, the way it's such a transitory kind of place. So you get people from all around the world coming through there. There's something, I mean, you know, jungle and drum and bass did this already. Like they mm. created a fusion of cultures and sounds that could only have come from the UK. Mm -hmm. you know, grime did that after Broken and the mm. same way that could only have come from the UK. Mm. And I think there's something very um, specific there where, I mean, it's twofold. One, one aspect of it is, you know, for example, looking at, looking at traditional forms of electronic club music and looking at jazz, you know, those forms come from outside London. You mm -hmm. know, so, you know, jazz, for example, being obviously a black American art form. Um, and I've, I've often thought about this where, you know, if you were born and raised in New Orleans, mm. then you, you'd have a certain perspective on jazz and you'd be very steeped in a in a really rich tradition of it. Mm -hmm. And if you were to choose to kind of do something more progressive and experimental with what you're doing, then it would, it would probably, from a, New Orleans, from a New Orleans perspective, it might be really progressive, but from looking at it from outside the states, it might just be a just a tiny bit different. Mm. So it was, I feel like it was it's harder when you're in the thick of a culture. It's harder to be objective about it um, and not feel kind of beholden to its rules and and legacy and tradition. Mm -hmm. So I feel like London's been a particularly great example of somewhere where you're able to reference things that are from other places, but because you're somewhere else and not in those places, it's easier to play with them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to take, to take, you know, Chicago house and, and like, you know, New York jazz and, and, you know, German electronic shit or whatever. And just like being able to, being able to bring that all together and it's together in a, in a way which, which is reassembled in a way that places, people in those places could never have done because they don't have the luxury of the objective perspective of, of distance. Right. Um, so that's, and that's, you know, I, I, there's no, I don't have any, any proof of this, but that's my theory anyway. Mm. And, then, yeah. and there's something about London where, you know, like it, the, the melting partners of it brings that all together. Mm. You know, and at that time specifically, there were, you know, the West London crew was from all over the place. Like, you know, Alex Atias is from Switzerland. You know, mm -hmm. Nathan and myself had come from New Zealand and we had community in Japan and in the States. And 
and then and then it was all you know it all came from came out of like New York and Soul and the influence of Kenny and Louis and mm -hmm. and then and then you know Kenny talks about how New York and Soul was just a reflection of their experience in the jazz room at Southport Weekend. Mm -hmm. So it's like all all the roads kind of go back and forth both ways. But I right. feel like yeah, London has a very special perspective on music always. Mm -hmm. Mm. What's and, and so considering considering all of that, what's your take on the London jazz scene at the moment? And um, you know, considering your musical history that was so formative for you um, in your career, uh, do you see a connection from what the that sort of UK broken beat melting pot slash jazz scene from back in the you know early parts of the century was doing to what the current London jazz scene is doing now? Yeah, no question about it. I mean, the the current London jazz scene, the way it is, and and I, I don't even know if the participants all realize this, but they they all know that it wouldn't exist without you know Tomorrow's Warriors and mm. you know what Court, what Courtney Pine and Julian Joseph and people like that did and Gary Crosby, but it absolutely would not exist without the Broken Beat scene. You know, mm. if if co-op co hadn't existed, Steam Down would not exist. Right, like. To me, there's just no question about that. And it's really cool, like, essentially a generation later, seeing the the current generation of musicians just embracing that whole breadth of legacy and history. Um, and it's, you know, it's what gives UK jazz a sound. And, mm. you know, it, it, it's it's what makes Sons of Kemet unlike anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's it, it couldn't that couldn't come from anywhere else. That kind of that amalgamation of you know African diaspora and you know UK club head mentality. It's just it's so uniquely London. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, cool. it's, it's, the, the connection is un undeniable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so zooming in to uh, Crisis and Opportunity Volume One, London, the album which. Uh, you kindly contributed synth parts for. Um, so you worked on this remotely, obviously you live in Los Angeles and um, the rest of the band is based here in London. Um, so for you, how was it working on this project where you're sort of given something that's already to some degree a pre-existing entity and having to find a way inside it with um, your sort of knowledge of synth and how to sort of make that work in a live band context how did you find that process i mean i i loved it like the it was really interesting you know when i you know when you sent me the record in progress it was you know it, it that could have easily been the finished record mm. like you know as far as you know an acoustic jazz record it was it was done you know you guys did a great job you know solid tunes great playing good vibes um but it was great you know to be asked to contribute and have the opportunity to add something that 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 kind of reframes it like you know i feel like the contributions that i made and the things that you wanted from me you know they're, they're fairly subtle but the idea of being able to basically add some production to to make it not to make it more than what it already was mm. and i think that's that's always that's always the mission with with production like literally mm -hmm. you're trying to you know take something further than than where it already is and and help it re help it realize its vision um and and you know doing you know adding synth, synth parts and being able to bring a different sonic frequency and texture into it um was just it was just fun and you know i, I know i know what you dig um and you mm -hmm. know what i you know what i you know what i dig so it, it wasn't difficult to find those spaces. Um, and I, and I, I think it comes down to a little bit of irreverence too. You know, there's a, there's a more, the more traditional person might feel like it was kind of square peg round hole. It's like, well, here's a, mm. here's a jazz, here's a jazz, was it a quintet or a sextet? And, and, and it's basically a finished record. And now we're going to put some, Simpson here, like you know, right. that could be a little strange um, mm. to some people, but you know, for me, it's like I think it, it is a, 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 a popular kind of mentality these days. It's like whatever, you know, it's, it's just it's just some music, and there's no rules about what can or can't go on it. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, just super fun to contribute. Yeah, and I kind of think um, on reflection, listening to the record, to me it adds like like what you added as a synth performer slash producer or however you want to call it was like this layer of like it made it somewhat orchestral sure with, i mean obviously it's not it's not orchestral instruments but it was like it definitely created a layer of orchestration to it which i mm. think added so much more depth and color and um it didn't take away from the live energy that was happening in the room but it just sort of you know it expanded the sonic width that the music had in a way that if i was to not that i've had lots of experience orchestrating for an actual orchestra but like when you think of how great composers and arrangers write symphonies there's like it's just using all of these different textures of an orchestra to kind of create a mood and a palette that's yeah. greater than the pure melodic and harmonic content of the raw material of the composition itself it's like here's the um here's the mm. melody and the harmony and the rhythm but then on top of that there's like the spectrum of sound which yeah the great orchestrators do and i think that you gave the the record that which is which is really great and takes it to a place that you know that's greater than the entire sum of its parts in my view so thank nice, you man i mean yeah. i'm super happy to contribute mm. and it's, it's interesting too where like doing it after the fact you know, had I had I been with you all in London, I, don't, it, it, I mean, obviously it would have been different mm. um, anyway. But I think this, in this particular case, it was much more potent to do it separately, like afterwards. You know, once mm. the band and late, you know, you laid it all down, and then it's clear for me, you know, what were the spaces and and also how to not um, how to not overwhelm it because mm. obviously it's you know it's fundamentally an acoustic band project so like you're saying it's, it's like adding those little bits and it reminds me a little of um i remember when i was in, in school in japan i go to this little jazz video dvd cafe called swing it's mm -hmm. just there are hundreds and hundreds of dvds and videos you request whatever you want and I, I got a lot of my education there but there was one 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 um video i used to watch a lot and it was a Blue Note thing, and it was it was Wayne Shorter, Michelle Petrucciani, Stanley Clark, Lenny White. That's the band, and mm. then Gil, um, Gil Goldstein was playing keys, okay. like kind of background keys. Mm. Um, and and I remember at the time I didn't really I didn't really understand that kind of concept, mm. and I revisited the video years later. I was like, oh shit, now I hear it. Like, mm. you know, you've got this, you know, killing quartet who don't actually need anything else. But then mm. here you've got this guy just kind of, you know, sprinkling, you know, a little extra, little extra seasoning on it, you know? Mm. And it's, it's a vibe for sure. Mm. Nice. Um, so this question is probably a little bit weird in terms of it being me that's asking it, but how do you see me, my early man Sansa, in the broader context of what's happening in the London slash global jazz scene at the moment? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know. But what I will say is, is that, you know, you're being really prolific, which is fantastic. Um, you know, I, I love that you have a really, you know, broad range of taste, you know, like, you know, we talk about open format DJs, you know, I think you're, you know, like myself, very much into the idea of being an open format musician. Mm. You know, whether it's some, you know, hardcore electronic shit or some, you know, burning, burnout jazz vibe, you know, whether you're playing drums or programming beats or, you know, writing or arranging, you know, that you have that breadth and interest in, in such a wide range of music is really important um, and valuable. And then that you have, you know, you have your own cultural roots as well as being from New Zealand and, you know, bringing those to London is just, it's more, you know, it's more in the London gumbo. You know, it's, it's, it's mm. more, it's a whole nother flavor in there. And I know that, um, you know, I, I know that there are, you know, you're, you're, a, you're an individual, 
you know, you're a unique, you're uniquely you. You know, no one does you like you do you. And so, offering that to the London community, I think, is is really dope. Because um, you know, we all end of the day, it's I, I feel like, you know, for my whole life, traveling, living in different parts of the world, collaborating in different parts of the world, that has always made me better, and it's always it's always been a contribution to wherever I've gone. Mm. And you know, I see you doing something similar in your own way. So I think, yeah, there's only only good things to come from that. And and you know, if you if you keep keep up this level of prolificness and the, the box set's not far away, so it's all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cool. And uh last but not least, um how have you personally adjusted to life in lockdown? Um and how have you found it's affected your career and your musicianship and anything else that you would want to add for you and I mean I guess in particular because you're in Los Angeles right now which is still like I, I get the impression it's probably about the same level of locked downness there that it is here in London and how's it been for you? Yeah I imagine you're right um I think in terms of you know, kind of career and musicianship, like it's it's way too early to tell. Like if we have this conversation in 10 years time, I'll have some perspective and be able to tell you. Mm. Um, but the biggest change for me has been being in one place. Like I haven't been in one place this long since 1999. Wow. And, you know, I've literally been on tour for 20 years nonstop. And so like, that, that's obviously a change. <laughs> mm. um, and I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed being in one place, being able to focus my energy in one place. Um, you know, touring, touring has, has been very physically taxing for me, just the, probably the nature of just popping on and off planes every night. But also, you know, I carry a lot of equipment, mm. setting up, pack, packing down. It's just, you know, physically there's wear and tear on that. And, at the start of the pandemic, I happened to have my, like I had a, had a back issue really show its ugly head big time. Mm. And, you know, that's pretty much coming right now. But I do know that had I been touring last year, then it may have gotten like really, really bad. Mm. Um, so on a physical level, I'm really grateful to have had this break. Um, and then, you know, creatively, I mean, one cool thing is that I, I never, ever set up my live rig at home mm -hmm. in the past because I'm always touring. So the, the kind of home rig or the studio rig will be different, the live rig. But once March last year hit, I was like, well, I'm not going anywhere. I might as well set, set all my shit up. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's been great to actually just have this full rig always set up and, you know, really getting into the whole, the whole idea of digital and virtual offerings. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I launched my Patreon um, early last year, and and that's been really great just to to build community community mm -hmm. online in a way with more honestly with more kind of intimacy and kind of more more community connection than I've ever experienced with fans before. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's been really special, and just you know knowing that you know we we all get those those messages from once in a while where someone's like, hey man, you should come to you know Bratislava and play. And it's always like, well, I'd love to, but you know, find me a promoter who'll get me there. Right. And right. then you go and, and, and then you go and play there, and there's like ten people in the room because there's only ten people who really love your shit. Right. Um, which is all cool, but at the end of the day, like being able to be at home in LA, do a live stream um, set, and be able to have that have those ten people from Bratislava tune in, as long as, as, as along with someone from. New Zealand and across the states and Australia and China and wherever else, you know, mm. that's, I mean, I think the way, the way technology has come into play through this time is incredible and I'm, I'm immensely grateful that this didn't happen 20 years ago. Right, right. You know, <laughs> like pre-Zoom, pre-broadband, all that stuff, like, uh -huh. woof, that would be tough. Mm. Yeah, all in all, it's been positive for me. Um, it's, and it's been, I think there's something really empowering about being in one place that I mm -hmm. hadn't really experienced before. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, man, just, you know, learning, living and growing. Awesome. 